Thanks for joining us and welcome to the Hoff Center webinar speaker series, Hoffy Topics. My name is Darren and I'm part of the success team here at Hofsteiner. The Hoff Center webinar speaker series, Hoffy Topics, is a free online educational seminar with presentations from our lead researchers and Hoff scientists. I'll host a new speaker with me here every Tuesday throughout the months of May and June to keep you up to date on industry trends and helpful insights. Under current stay-at-home orders, we hope these presentations help bring supportive inspiration to your lives and your craft. Each presentation was created to address hop-related challenges brewers face on a daily basis, and we hope their latest discoveries help you in your quest to brew better beer. Before I introduce you to our guest speakers, everyone should know that comments and questions are absolutely welcome. Each will be addressed at the end of the webinar using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. A link with each webinar recording will be available on our website under the online customer portal page shortly after each presentation. Simply sign up on our website to watch or download. Here with us today, we have Frank Pfeiffer, Technical Director of Product Development at Hofsteiner Germany, along with our questions moderator, Mike Sutton, Vice President of Craft Sales. Frank Pfeiffer started his brewing career 35 years ago after receiving his degree as an engineer in brewing science and beverage technology. Prior to his career at Hofsteiner, Frank worked at the Weihen Stefanauer Brewery as Director of Operations. Frank currently supports R&D activities at Hofsteiner for new product development and technical applications. In his most recent 20 plus years in the field, Frank has served as a trusted advisor for the Master Brewers exams at the IHK in Munich and as a technical confidant to breweries both large and small across the globe. Also here with us today is Matt Ahrens, head brewer at Almondson Brewery in Oslo, Norway. Matt has been with Almondson since the summer of 2016, expanding their range of beer styles and growing the brewery from 4,200 hectoliters to 10,000 hectoliters within a two-year window. Matt and his team trialed the hop separation vessel at their facility in Oslo not too long ago, and will jump on with us here shortly with their findings and feedback. Matt, Frank, thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Darren, for your kind introduction. Um, today, we have a very nice topic that I want to refer about and also uh, match later on after my presentation. Um, it's called the Braukorn Hopsteiner Hop Separation Solution to Reduce Beer Losses. And uh, maybe you heard about this device that was um, released some years ago as a called um, Beer Cleaner. And uh, now Hopsteiner joint cooperation with Braucon, especially with the Braucon co-partner Banke Process Solutions to, um, yeah, to bring up a better construction for a market release with also a good hygienic design of this device. So let's have a look about the problem that we have that everybody knows and everybody sees who's making craft beers, especially dry hop beers. And um, by adding the pellets, they begin to swell and they consume beer. And so we see beer losses by volume and we also have beer losses by weight. By volume, it looks not that bad at six times when the pellets swell, but they have a very low density. And by look on the weight of the pellets, it can swell to 11 or sometimes to 12 times it also depends on the um, on the density of the material. But you see 11, 12 times, that's a lot. And that can cause more or less beer losses. That is depending uh, on how much hops you add, on uh, how is your system built, how can you separate um, the plant material. And some, some of the guys uh, find beer losses up to 30%. That is something that you have when you have very big hop loads. But um, I think they also have uh, minimum losses uh, and they are not very satisfied with this situation and they do everything to reduce the losses because there's money in the beer they send to the drain. That is how it looks when you, um, when you add pellets into beer. Normally they go very easily into solution. The dissolution of pellets in beer is very good even at low temperatures and this picture shows um, we have three different type of pellets with different densities. That is 520, 665, and 700 and 
16 gram per liter. Um, what you find in real life, that is something in between 520 and 665. 70, 716, that's very high density. And we, um, we can see very nice here at the beginning, they are on the surface of the beer. And this one, this guy here rushed down immediately after the pellets were adding to the beer. But after a while, next picture, after two hours, we see that the pellets dissolved completely. And it doesn't matter if they have a low density or if they have a high density. High density means they are compressed a little bit harder. And it's not a problem to use a little bit harder pellets and after two hours, they are completely in solution. But we can also see that um, part of them, of the material, of the particles that tend to swim on the surface of the beer and part of them that tend to sink down to the ground. And that is after two hours. So what happens after a day or a week when the material is in the tank? Um, we think that even after a week, we still have some material here on top because they are lightweight material that doesn't sink down. But most of the volume of the pellets is here close to the bottom area of the tank. So if we see this as a beer tank, we have a problem with hops lorries here on the bottom and we have a problem here coming up at the end when we empty the tank when we um, when we pump the beer from a bottom valve into another tank or into a cleaning device or whatever it is so in the middle in the core uh, flow or area of the beer the concentration of solid material is relatively low compared to the bottom and the top what does it also say? When the material begins to sink down or swim on the surface, right after the addition, after two hours in a, um, any kind of container, we have a concentration of material on the bottom where we have a higher, also higher um, extraction of aroma compounds than in the middle area of the tank. So we will receive layers in the tank. And the higher the tank is, the more layers, the more different types of beer you will have in the tank, and that is something that you need to homogenize. Independent from the hops lorry, you have to eliminate, you have to have a look on homogenization of your product. So we have, uh, let me say, we have four different ways to get rid of this vegetative green hop material. And one of the simplest one is by sedimentation. And that yeah, depends on on time, it also depends on the movement of the particles. Are they quiet and able to settle down as we have seen before in the, in the last slide? And uh, I think that we, it also depends a little bit on certain hop products and maybe also on certain hop varieties. It could be that also some other drop compounds are involved like uh, protein, polyphenol particles like uh, yeast cells. And they have also an influence on the sedimentation of the whole particle mixture uh, in a beer tank. Centrifugation, that could be an option, but um, as far as I know from colleagues uh, around the world which used their centrifuge, once built to um, reduce the concentration of yeast and, and haze, they have problems by blockings when they use the centrifuge machine to remove these green hop particles because relatively big uh, uh, green hop particles compared to a yeast cell. And we know that the centrifuge um, is, a, is a, let me say, um, a package of plates and the split or the, the diameter in between the, the plates um, is very, 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 very tiny. And the hop particles also have to pass this if they don't, they block the machine. And then it could be that you have damages because it begins to unstabilize. And we had a lot of um, information about this, that people had to remove everything, clean everything by hand, or at the end of the day, the machine was damaged. There are some machines on the market. They are specially built to remove bigger particles, especially 
for the for dry hop beers, they may, maybe can handle this, but then you have only a centrifuge just for this operation, not for any other operation to clean up your beer from from uh, from other true particles or from yeast. Um, last comment about the usage of centrifuge. Um, I think or we think that it's better if you have a pre-cleaning equipment and then finally you only have small particles and then you are able to let this um, let this beer run over the centrifuge and then you have a very evenly uh, uh, um, running of this machine at the end. Um, next option is filtration. We know uh, that we have, if it is sieve or split candles, um, it doesn't matter if when a, when a big amount of hop uh, particles are coming into a filter system, they can block it immediately and then it's impossible to reblock it and to, uh, to get good filter performance anymore. And also with very high beer losses. And we have to know when we have to stop our process, if we have to open our equipment, especially here for the filter, then we start again, we have a next high impact of oxygen. So everything what we are do to interrupt the process and to start again brings ox oxygen impact, dissolved oxygen into our process. And that has a big, very big influence, especially on the uh, dry hop beers. So next, next one, the fourth solution can be the Braukorn Hopsteiner. And uh, how this device works, I will explain with the following slides. So that is a drawing, how this one was designed and the, pro and the process is, uh, is flowing. We have a dry hop beer that comes here from the right side and there's a pre-flooding pre tank on top of the uh, device and it fills up with beer and then it runs over a tearing edge in a very thin film over the sieve and the hop particles, they slide down here on the and the upper side of the sieve and the beer disappears through the splits and is um, collected here in another tank, in a second tank. And then it's uh, the separated beer is pumped into a BBT or whatever you have afterwards. So that is a very easy principle of the cleaning effect with this special kind of, uh, of sieve that we are using with a special ankle that we can uh, run a process, an ongoing process without any interruption when we feed new beer into the device and separate the hop particles here. They fell down or into this um, ground or bottom area of this cylindric tank and they're collected there and in between you can open a valve and remove them easily because you always have this device under pressure. It's always under CO2 atmosphere. And especially this one was built also to handle high pressures. We can go up to four atmospheres over pressure with this device to avoid foaming, to avoid any other problems that this um, circle is still running without any interruption and foaming, especially. So that is uh, some pictures from our prototype that we once produced um, and used for a test. You see here that is the, the top where the beer is coming over the, uh, the tearing edge, the thin film runs down. And here we see that the liquid disappears and that the separated hot particles, they remain here on the strainer. Next picture comes from the, um, from the lower side of the, uh, of the strainer. And here you see how the green material rushes down. And after a while it rushes down we also have, a, let me say, a second effect of, um, of dewatering. That is, comes very, definitely very dry out of this device and falls down to the bottom. So this video that comes now is showing um, a test that we did, a special test. I come later on to the, um, to the setup, but here we used a hop load of more than six kilogram that means more than 16 uh, pound per barrel, six kilogram per hectoliter, um, to, to see and to find out how um, the sieve performs with a very high hop load.
So from here, on the left side, there's a chamber, the flooding chamber, and it flows over. And from here, we have the, the tearing edge where this film with the hot particles is rushing down. And especially here in this area, you can see that a lot of the liquid is disappeared through the splits of the sieve. And the more far that you go down, you see that the material gets more and more drier. So that's a picture from the opposite side, from the bottom, where the dried material comes down, stucks a little bit, and then it is falling or it falls into the chamber that is there on the ground. You see, the, it looks very dry. Um, let me say the, um, the concentration of, of dry material is normally around 10%. So there's still 80, 90% water inside. This one was made to show you to the differences between the beer, the dry hop beer before the beer cleaner device and the beer after the separation process. Um, we took a sample from the, from the pipe system that was um, uh, with beer flowing into the device, into the beer cleaner. And even there we see the effect that we have some particles here on top and most of the particles are settled down more or less immediately here on the on the bottom of the glass. So that is a hop drop. And also here on top, we have a little bit of hop slurry. After separation, there are still particles inside. So that means 100% removement of the particles is not possible. But that's, let me say, it's logical because you have a, a sieve, a strainer with a certain diameter of splits. And in between the splits or through the splits, um, the beer is. Um, is moving, is disappearing from the hop slurry and also some of the smaller particles that takes the same way. We, we checked the distribution of the particle sizes um, before the device, that is a dry hop beer, before the filtration process, before the beer cleaner device. Um, first, all the, the bigger particles were removed with a centrifuge in the laboratory so that only the smaller particles below 900 micrometer remain. And then they were uh, tested. And you see here that is a very evenly distribution of these particles from, let me say, zero up to 350, 400 micrometers. And then it goes down. So very even distribution that was before the device. And the next uh, particle distribution is, so, is showing the situation behind uh, the beer cleaner. And here you see now my maximum, and there's a very high maximum of particles, is around 50 micrometers. Um, we used, for this test, we used a strainer with a split uh, diameter of 250 micrometers. 250, that is here. Normally, it means that particles bigger than 250 they are taken out of the process and particles smaller than 250, they stay in the process. But that's not truth here. In this fact, we see that the maximum is at 50 micrometers and then it goes down immediately. And when we have a look here around 80 micrometers, um, we find more than 80% of the particles, of the remaining particles in this beer. Um, our first idea was we have to find also bigger particles uh, up to 250 micrometers. But there's a typical physical effect that is going on when the, um, when the liquid runs down and has to change its direction immediately. And that happens when the beer runs down the strainer and then it has to change the direction into the splits. That is an angle of 90 degrees and then the liquid disappears, takes the smaller particles with it because they are able uh, to change their direction the same way, but bigger particles are not able to change their direction because their mass and their energy is too high and so they uh, run the way down with the slurry and they are, um, yes, they are taken out of the process. And that is what we like. So it works very well and this physical effect is called the Quanda effect. 
Let's talk about the setups that we have and that we also tested in different breweries. We will hear a little bit more about um, test results from our colleague Matt from, um, from Norway. He tested the beer cleaner. And um, that is one setup that is the easiest you can imagine. That is to make a dry hop beer here on the left side. We have an agitator with a preparation tank and then you make your dry hopping. You can also put it di uh, directly into your tank, whatever you like. It's just an example. So then you start to pump the whole liquid from your storage tank after dry hopping over the beer cleaner device into a sedimentation tank. Sedimentation tank means it takes a while and then the sediments begin to sink down. Now we talk only about the small particles. The small particles passing the beer cleaner strainer where we found the maximum particle size of 50 micrometers. So it takes a while. It depends on the tank height and on the volume uh, that you have. 12 is a little bit low, 12 hours, but you will see it after a while, the particles, they, um, they sink down um, to the ground of the tank. And afterwards, you remove the slurry from the bottom, and then you are able to bring the beer into the next tank, BBT, or directly into bottling or whatever you want to do. Let me say again, please take care about the homogeneity of your product. In every stages where you have beer for a longer period without any movement. That is how it looks in, in glass cylinders. Um, that is around 25 to 30 centimeters. That is a um, sample after the Hopsteiner and that is after one hour, 20 minutes sedimentation. So most of these particles, they are now here on the ground of the glass cylinder. That is how it looks in detail. That is right after the device. That is after one hour, six hours, and after 24 hours. And you can see that more and more particles, they sediment to the bottom, to the ground. And it's not really green. It's a little bit uh, light white and green. It's a mixture. So it's, you can imagine and see that it's, uh, these particles are not 100% hop related because we can imagine that when small hop particles can pass the strainer also, yeast cells and also some other protein, polyphenol, hazy compounds are able to pass the strainer and they are eliminated here this way and they normally have a white or brownish color. That is how the residue looks. That is what we sent from the sedimentation tank here into this um, plastic bucket that was after, after two days. We waited from Friday, Sunday and then on Monday morning we started to fill the beer directly after removing the sediments into, uh, into bottles. That is the result after bottling. So this beer was taken out of the bottle in the brewery directly after filling. You see, um, it's still cloudy. You still have cloudy compounds inside. So it's, it still has this um, few uh, like, uh, like a dry hop beer, unfiltered dry hop beer. And here's the, the surface of the foam shows no more green particles anymore, everything is clear. And that was a, let me say, good result with a good utilization of beer and a way to reduce the beer losses a little bit. Now coming to the next setup, what we also can do, especially for the bigger guys who have a centrifuge, um, who have bigger, uh, bigger tanks, bigger volumes, where it makes sense to also install a little bit of automatization if they like. Um, at the beginning, we have the same situation. We dry up a tank and after a while we start to bring the beer from the storage tank over the beer cleaner, but not the whole volume. We have seen in the, in the second slide that there is a very good distribution of particles in a container where a lot of material is on the ground. It's dark green and some of them, they are still here on top. And that is what we now use with the um, application of the beer cleaner that we start to bring the first hectoliters or the first uh, barrels over the device. And when we see that clear beer is coming out of the tank, then we stop using the beer cleaner. Maybe it looks like this, that we have less particles. Then we stop using uh, the beer cleaner. We close the valves and we go directly the way 
into the centrifuge. Meanwhile, we have a lot of beer in the buffer tank from the first process, so we can blend it. So we have no more problems again. We are rid of these uh, big particles and we don't, um, we don't face any more problems with blocking of the centrifuge. Um, to be on the safe side, because sometimes, especially in this area here, where the tank, the conical tank area goes into the cylindrical tank or area, we find big loads of hop sediments. And when they rush down suddenly, and they're not controlled, they go directly more or less into the centrifuge. And then we have the same problem again um, that we are talking about at the beginning. So we also have to be um, with an eye on the process, even if this is running much better now, and we can go directly into the BBT, we have no more sedimentation to do anymore because uh, that is done more or less by the centrifuge on a turbidity, whatever you like. And then we can uh, walk directly from the BBT into the bottling area. Next setup, that is something that we are now working on together with, um, with Browcom. That is a combination with a new device that is called Hopgun Pro. What does it mean? The Hopgun Pro is a, um, a device or a vessel where you can uh, homogenize hop pellets together with water or with beer with an agitator to make a very homogeneous liquid. And this liquid is then the base liquid that we sent over the beer cleaner device. And then we filter a high concentrated aroma uh, uh, solution, high concentrated liquid with a lot of hop aromas. And that is the base, the feed material for our dry hopping later on in bigger CCTs. So that is a construction or a setup for, let me say, bigger, much bigger applications for guys with big tanks, thousands of barrels or hectoliters. Um, maybe they have um, automated system. They don't need this big loads of green hop material in the system. So um, that is an application where we um, can remove these particles before they enter the automatized part of the brewery. But now let's have a look on the, on the drawing, how it works. You see here that is the Hopgun Pro, and that is the setup um, for the test that we did where we made the movie with 6.5 kilograms per liter. And that was a high concentration that was a de uh, aerated and uh, uh, demineralized water that we used. I think that is a better option compared to beer. I would always recommend to use to use water here in CO2 atmosphere, and then um, you can reduce your, your oxygen impact. If you have beer here inside, you have problems with foaming or whatever, and the oxygen impact to the beer gives directly a bad, um, a bad result to the quality. So the agitator was always running, so it was always here uh, in suspension, and we were able to pump this slurry easily over the device and made our separation. Um, we were surprised a little bit because it was very easy and uh, we were able to um, increase the, the flow rate uh, on levels we never expected by such a high hop load. And it works very well and the concentrated beer or the concentrated liquid, whatever you call it over this, you can directly pump into your CCT and here you do your dry hopping and here you can stay how long as you like. And then normally you only have small particles and subsequently you use a centrifuge to install the haze of the beer and then you have a product ready to fill. So that is how it looks. That is the uh, skid unit here on, on, on roads for transportation or for storage in your brewery. Um, when, you, when you rise it up um, to this certain angle that you need where the sieve is inside, um, the height of the full device will be around uh, 3.2 meters, 3.4 meters up to the top. So on the left side, that is uh, my predecessor, that is uh, the former technical director of Hopsteiner Germany, Mr. Willy Mitter. And uh, he had the idea, so he's normally more or less the in inventor of this device. But uh, let me say the, the technical application that you see here at the end of the day was done by the guys and the corporation from Hopstein, uh, from, from Braucon. 
So that is how it looks from the side. And you see this finger here has to be erected and you take the, the cylinder up with the forklifter and then you push in uh, this one, adjust it here and then it's done. Everything is easy to, um, to bring up and down again. Right picture on the bottom, you see uh, how it looks inside. Here's the, there's a strainer with these small splits one after another where the beer can pass through and the hop slurry um, remains on the surface, on the top. Okay, now that's all from my side now. Um, we are very good in time, so I give the words uh, to my colleague, Matt, from, mm -hmm. from the practical uh, application, and we'll talk about practical application, what he found um, regarding this device, the Hopsteiner. Thank you for the handover, Frank. Um, yeah. So we were lucky enough to try all the uh, Hopsteiner for a couple of months uh, last year. And we produce a lot of pretty heavily uh, dry hopped beers ourselves. And as Frank mentioned and made very clear that um, the centrifugation of heavily dry hopped beers can be a bit problematic uh, from time to time. So um, we found that pre-hop uh, pre standard trials that our best aid in sending our beers through our own centrifuge was working with the cone day after day and just relying on the use of time. So um, when we saw the hop standard at uh, Braubeviala in uh, 2018, we were intrigued by the concept. Uh, we have a Braucon brew house ourselves. We know the team over there and have only good stuff to say about their stuff. So we were very intrigued. We wanted to give it a try. And when we were lucky enough to finally get it over, uh, we had a bunch of beers lined up to uh, start beginning our trials. Uh, Frank mentioned how the hop steiner is intended to be used. Um, and we ran our first few trials uh, in that manner, where we would take finished dry hop to beer that had been conditioned and send it over to a buffering tank before we would later centrifuge the beer. We found that it was highly effective uh, once the beer had been properly homogenized. Without homogenization, the flow of the beer across the Hopsteiner was irregular and involved a lot more maintenance. But with thoroughly homogenized product, you could establish a baseline flow in and out of the Hopsteiner, and it worked a dream. Uh, on the back side of that, once we had our beer in the buffering tank, centrifugation was easier than it had ever had been. We were able to dial in our uh, turbidity levels. We were able to send the beer through the centrifuge at higher flow rates with fewer de-sludges. It made life much, much easier. But we're a brewery that doesn't typically have uh, an empty vessel at any given time. So we were kind of intrigued to see if we could wrangle the Hopsteiner into a way that fit our existing processes. So our first uh, attempt was to try to utilize the Hopsteiner in an inline recirc through the CCFV. So we would dry hop uh, at any given rate from the, the lowest dry hop rate that we tried was one kilo per hecto and the highest was 3.75. Uh, we would try recirculating the beer at conditioning temperatures after we had chilled the beer through the Hopsteiner, of course, after we had re-homogenized it. Um, and we wanted to see to what extent we could effectively remove uh, the particulate in that tank without sending it to another tank and then sending it from that CCFB onwards to BBT through our centrifuge. And we found it worked really, really well. Um, it was very effective. Again, it relied heavily on uh, homogenization, uh, but we were pretty happy with the results. We wanted to take it yet another step further. Again, we do a lot of heavily dry hopped beers at higher dry hop rates. We know the dark side of some of these heavily dry hop beers is that um, having that much hop in the beer can result in an over extraction, especially if you're letting the beer sit on the hops at the base of the cone while you try to work with the cone. 
day after day in order to remove those hops in preparation for, centri in, in preparation for centrifugation. So uh, we thought, you know, let's try it, uh, let's try it a couple days after we've dry hopped uh, with our hop gun. And while the beer is still at uh, dry hop, at dry up temperatures, which for us is around 18, 19 C, uh, before we've crashed the beer. With the thinking being that at that stage, we'll still have a lot of yeast and suspension. We won't have uh, let that settle to the bottom, that the pops by and large won't be so heavily concentrated in the cone as they would be during conditioning. And what our hope was there was that we could lock in our flavor and aromatic profile that we were looking for when, um, as soon as we thought we reached it, which was usually about two days afterwards, and then just remove the vegetative matter. That worked brilliant as well. There was very little need for any kind of mechanical uh, modernization. We didn't have to hook up a pump. We didn't have to do anything. We just uh, hooked up our hop steiner, sent it through in a recirc, and uh, we almost nearly always achieved our expected discharge volume through the hop steiner. The amazing benefit to that was that once we did crash the beer and once we were set up for centrifugation is that we didn't need to spend that week plus working with the cone of our tanks in order to get all of those hops out. The beer had finished fermenting, we sent it down to zero, we let the yeast settle out, we hooked it up to the centrifuge and sent it over. And so we were able to shave off upwards of like 20% of our total tank residency time uh, from uh, you know pitch to centrifugation. And that was a huge benefit for us. It allowed us a lot of flexibility. We did notice an increased, uh, we noticed a benefit in uh, our sensory panel that the beers did seem to have less of a hop bite uh, the ones that did see the hop center, that they didn't sit on the hops as long. That might be particular to us, but by and large, the overall um, use of the hop steiner benefited us in a lot of ways that fit to our existing processes. Ones that I don't think necessarily uh, Browcon or even hop center had thought maybe that's that were possible, but. We were able to try it in that way. We were very happy. Um, it's, yeah, it was, it was a very useful tool and very effective at, uh, what Frank is, uh, at what Frank has detailed what it's supposed to do. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody else uh, if they've got any further questions, if they want to hear a little bit more detail about some of the trials that we ran, or if they've got any other odd questions about... Um, what might, uh, what I think might or might not work with the, the Hopsteiner, but uh, I'm all ears at this point. Okay, thank you, Matt. And um, yeah, now we, we come to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for the cooperation um, with Norway and with the United States. And um, the gates are still open for, for questions and my colleague Mike will then take over and read the questions and I will try or Matt will try to answer. Okay, thank you, Frank and uh, Matt, appreciate it. So uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. First question, uh, probably uh, to both of you. Uh, did you have a chance to test using the dried hop material for the bittering addition and another beer at the beginning of the boil? That is not something we tried. Um, there, were, there was there was talk about um, about trying trying to uh, recycle uh, a hop matter that we recovered through the hop steiner because, as Frank has mentioned, it it's rather dry, but it's it's still rather wet, if you know what I mean. Um, that we felt like the timing would have to be perfect in order to take that recovered hop matter and then have a beer ready to go. Well, we thought that hot matter um, was ready. Uh, it's, it's, it gets a little bit tricky for us personally because we wouldn't have any way of measuring 
um, exactly what sort of alpha we would expect to pull out. We were more we were more interested in maybe chucking it into the whirlpool, to be honest. Um, even though we extract a lot of aromatics from uh, those hops in the beer that they went into, I think every brewer knows that those hops that we're still putting down the drain, there's still a lot of aromatic properties in them. And so that was one thing that we, you know, we always kind of talked about, but it's it was never anything we pulled the trigger on. Okay. Frank, okay, you have from, comments? Yeah, some comments from my side, because it is a question that, that must come. It comes every time we are talking about this device. Um, yes, there is still alpha in the, in the residual material. That's, that's a fact. Um, to reuse it in the brew house, as Matt uh, uh, mentioned, you need the right point because it's, it's a fresh product, now it's wet, and then you have to use it directly as a fresh, wet hop product. So you need the time, uh, you, a good timing to bring it over in the brew house and put it in wherever you like. But it also depends on the point where you harvest, let me say harvest the uh, hop particles. If it's, if it's like a contact where we don't have this high mass of yeast is involved or other, uh, other cloudy compounds are involved, then your residual hop slurry or your residual hop material is, is let me say, cleaner. And then you may, can use it easier, much easier in your brew house. But on the other hand, let's have a look on the opposite side. When it comes from a storage tank where the whole um, yeast slurry is involved, where the other slurry is involved together with the hops, and then you add it into, into your kettle or into your whirlpool, you add a lot of bad material, you have a lot of um, dead yeast cells, you have a lot of uh, um, fatty acids from the yeast cells from the cell membrane that can go into the beer. And then later on, you ask yourself, why or where's my beer foam? That could be the problem. That is what I think. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, next question, Frank, I think this is uh, directed for, at you. It's, uh, what was the beer temperature at dry hopping and sedimentation stages during the trials? And does the beer temperature matter when using the hop steiner? Um, the beer temperature has not a direct effect on the, um, on the process, but if you have a certain concentration of CO2 in your beer at this stage of the, um, of the filtration with the Hopsteiner, then you have to adjust the right, uh, pressure on the device. And what we found is that you need, always need a little bit more over pressure in your tank than the real, um, pressure limit is where the beer normally uh, starts to lose CO2 or begins to foaming. Because when the beer rushes down, it's passing the sharp edges of the, of the, of the strainer splits. There's an edge where CO2 can, uh, can uh, be removed easily. And so you need a little bit more three or four tenths of a bar, more over pressure than usual to avoid foaming. That is the only impact uh, coming from temperature I can refer to. Matt, what do yeah, you we think? Didn't, we didn't notice any difference in temperature. We were using it down at 4C. We were using it up at 19C. Um, yep. it, behaved, it behaved well. Of course, uh, you know, there was a learning curve to using the Hopsteiner in the beginning, uh, but pressure was, pressure is key to everything. If you can, abate the foam and keep that down, uh, everything works just fine. Yep. Okay. Uh, next question. My brewery has a 10 barrel system. Do you have that for a small brewery? Uh, yes, it's a good question. That is, um, that is, that is one, uh, one, one scale that we are producing this device. So there's nothing smaller available. Um, we were talking about this, we were thinking about this in, in the past. Um, when you only, only have 10 hectoliters to, to move over this, uh, this device, it's also a question of cost uh, at the end of the day. Um, that's, that's, a little, that's a little low volume. So if you have, can, can, can use two or three tanks, that's, 
let me say 40, 60 hectoliters or barrels, um, then it's a little bit more volume. And then it makes sense to use this device with all the actions you have before and afterwards, because you have to clean, you have to get rid of, of all the uh, remaining green material inside and so on and so on. There's a little bit of work around as well. But for the smaller guys, we have yet, we have no solution uh, in form of a smaller device. And um, I think it's also a problem when you reduce the, um, um, the scale of your, of your, um, of your device, it's, it's hard to reduce the way the liquid and the hops goes down over the strainer. So, and to minimize it to from three, meet, from three meters down to one meter and 50, I think that is a way is, is much too short for a good separation. Oh, okay. Uh, Matt, what kind of beer losses do you have before and after the hop steiner unit? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, on a 40 heck, um, on a 40 heck brew, uh, I'd say a, a go to dry hop rate is about 1.5 kilos per hecto. Uh, and we were netting about 35 heck uh, in packaged volume after that. With a hop steiner, uh, we saw marginally increased yields. Um, but I think the point that I can't make clear uh, any clearer is that we were turning those beers a lot quicker. Uh, those heavily dry hop beers take a lot of work, take a lot of preparation in order to be able to move those beers onward, even with the centrifuge. Um, having the hop center in play for the time that we did allowed us to move those beers out of tank at a rate that we hadn't been able to do. And I think that was the, the big increase for yield that we saw. So basically in your particular setup or process, you found the tank turnover time was uh, the major benefit for you. For sure. And I mean, again, I have to admit that we chose to utilize the hop center or tried to, uh, chose to trial it in a way that was not the way that Braucon and Hopsteiner had suggested. We did trial it that way across a few different beers, but the bulk of our trialing was done with uh, recirculation in the CCFV. And if you want to look at our average kind of dry hop rates of uh, 15 grams per liter, uh, those beers would take us generally around 21 days uh, until they were ready to send over to the centrifuge. And then with the hop center in play, it was 16 or 17. Okay. Uh, so this is for Matt and Frank. Uh, what do you think is the maximum effective flow rate through the hop steiner? Uh, I mean, flow rate, uh, flow rate is key. Uh, you come out too fast and you just push, uh, you push beer down or very wet hop slurry across the sieve down into your uh, collection chamber. Um, but with thorough homogenization, uh, once you find your sweet point, uh, it, it really, it's, it's a steady flow throughout. Uh, we found that without homogenization or with non-thorough homogenization that you would run very slow and you would sort of, uh, collect a lot in the beginning or that you would struggle to move the beer through or across the Hopsteiner. But then after that, uh, the bulk of your beer would kind of almost ceremoniously pass through the Hopsteiner since you had already done a lot of your collection. Uh, so slow in the beginning and then fast towards the end. But with homogenization, you were able to establish a steady flow rate. We found again with recirculation in the tank that you know, we were on the max speed uh, that the pump built into the hop center could use, which is apparently between 50, 60 hecto an hour. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it went pretty fast. Uh, and that didn't matter if it was, um, didn't matter if it was 15 grams per liter or 25, not in our experience. Frank, any comments? Yes, Matt is absolutely on the right side. That is 100% uh, what, what I can say as well. So um, what we found, um, let me talk about two examples. One example that was the um, 
the movie from the test run with the high hop load. We did it with around 25 um, to 30 hectoliters. That is around uh, 20, 21, 22 to 25 barrels an hour. And as Matt said, okay, when, when there's no more or when there's a, a time where there's no more um, hop particles coming from the, from the tank with the beer, you can go up to, we did it at 80, we did it at 100 um, hectoliters an hour. But then now it depends on the pump that you have to move the filtered beer from the uh, from the Hopsteiner device into a bright pit tank later on. So that was for us a limited factor, but it's easy to solve with a bigger pump. Okay. Uh, question regarding uh, CIP of the unit. Uh, Matt, what was your experience uh, and basically what was involved to be able to clean the, the Hopsteiner after using it? You need a good ladder. <laughs> Uh, a good ladder <laughs> key. Um, yeah, a good. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's a manual CIP. Uh, it's nothing too automated. Um, there's a lot of valves on there, but that's nothing to get too scared about. Um, we found that. Oh, we found that once we got the rhythm of it, that it it wasn't uh, it wasn't too much of a pain to CIP. The hardest part was getting a ladder to kind of uh get up top and open up that huge manway um which is quite heavy uh spray it down up on the top a little bit we sent down some um dilute caustic to give it a little bit of a rinse before that but uh after that you know a thorough caustic nitric uh it, it polished up quite quickly uh we were a bit worried that uh, the sip itself would retain a lot of uh, the solids from uh, the actual caustic itself, but it was it was it was very clean towards the end. Uh, we're pretty happy with it. Very manual. You gotta you gotta make sure that uh, you know you you've got a stopwatch on you and that you're opening each of your valves at set intervals. But uh, after you've done a manual rinse through the top, that's that's really the only other manual work involved. Okay. Frank, any comments? Uh, yes, it's, we we have we installed a lot of spray balls. So even we try to to make an hygienic design. You see that we have a lot of um, internal um, compounds in this in this cylindrical tank, and um, but with the spray balls and the the valves open and close the valves manually, it, it was um, handleable to clean it. And um, in addition. To this, I want to, to mention that when you start with a beer cleaner to remove oxygen, this is what we did always, that we filled it with uh, deaerated water and then we pressed the water out with CO2 and then it was an oxygen-free atmosphere where we yeah. were able to we start did. with. Yeah, okay. we did the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Frank, uh, the question, I uh, thanks for you. Um, with the Hopsteiner, um, or the Browcon Hop Gun Pro, was the yield recorded for the 6.5 kilo per hectoliter experiment? No, we, we didn't um, record the yield. That was just a test that we did um, in, um, in the facility at Browcon in Sion to find out where's the limit of the strainer. And we, um, yes, I think that they, uh, mixed up the the numbers. We were talking about 650 gram per hectoliter, and they used 6,500 gram per hectoliter by chance. But the result was was very good for us. But we have no documentation uh, regarding the utilization of hop aroma compounds. Okay, very good. All right, uh, that pretty well wraps up the questions. I really appreciate uh, Matt and Frank uh, your uh, presentations and insight to the Hopsteiner Browcon. I just wanted to also mention that we currently have a prototype unit in the United States uh, that we are planning to trial starting at Real Ale Brewing Company. Uh, we're right now waiting for the coronavirus situation to um, uh, improve to where um, we'll be able to start the Browcon Hopsteiner up and do the test runs. And then we plan to move it to uh, uh, some different breweries throughout the US. So 
there'll be more follow-up information on this uh, hopefully later this year. So at this point, I'll go ahead and turn the webinar back over to Darren. Yeah, thank you, Matt, Mike, and Frank. Um, that wraps it up for our today's Hoppy Topic. Um, our next presentation will be right here at the same time next week with Dr. Jean-Paul May discussing advanced hop products and when and where to use them. As always, links to each recording can be found by visiting our customer portal page on our website. If more questions happen to come up, uh, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Once again, my name is Darren. Thanks for joining us and happy brewing.